If you're just now joining this, this is the 24th Amelia Island Concorde Elegance. You're watching the live stream presented by Reliable Carriers here on HistoricRacingNews.com. Of course, none of this would be possible without Reliable Carriers. We, we saw the piece earlier, not only getting all the cars here, but supporting us on this live stream. Bob Sellers, the COO of Reliable, thank you for your support and for thank bringing you. all of this together. It's our pleasure. This is uh, part of the things we do. What's been your favorite moment of the weekend? Oh, my, fa <laughs> my favorite moment of the weekend won't come until tomorrow morning when everything's loaded and gone. Okay. <laughs> that must be a, a, a big, I'm not going to say worry because you you do it so much and so oh often. Oh, no, we still worry. You, do <laughs> <laughs> you still worry. <laughs> but the white gloves go on. and Exactly, yeah. No, and, well, uh, but, but we're very blessed. We have a, we have a wonderful group of drivers that work for us that are trained and know what they're doing and take the responsibility very seriously so uh, but that doesn't mean I don't worry no I'm sure yeah. because uh, that, that must must be important we heard that you've got a big fleet of, of trucks on the road uh, we've got a little over 400 units on the road yes we're, we're, we're the largest enclosed carrier in North America so uh, you know and I've got about 75 units here in Amelia Island right now so We've had uh, over 300 cars here today that are part of the Concord, but also the auctions. Um, you're re responsible for, for transporting many of them. Yeah, uh, we what's the biggest challenge? Uh, the, just the logistics of everything, the timing of everything. The, you know, you've got the Concord going on, so those folks want their cars at certain times. You've got the, uh, the auctions that want their cars gone by certain times. So the logistics, and then trying to make it all fit. Mm -hmm. So you've got a car like you just saw, you've got this car coming up, uh, and then I've got you know a Ferrari or a Porsche or something. So for me, it's like putting a puzzle together. They're not all the same shape. They're not all the same. <laughs> and, and, then, and then, of course, where they're all going. So obviously, we try to send the truck in the same general direction. Um, so you, that's all the pieces that we put together to make this all work for everybody. So. Where did the, the truck that traveled the farthest, where did it come from? Uh, we had a truck come from uh, Blaine, Washington. That's probably the farthest distance. Wow. Uh, had one come out of Maine, but I think Washington probably would win. Yes. Yeah. With the weather conditions that we've oh, had that across was, the United yeah. States the last few weeks, the I trucks, imagine. The trucks that came out of the Northwest were struggling. I mean, it was, yeah. a, it was a slug to get here. It was... Uh, we bad weather we had bad weather uh, we picked up a car in reno from the harris museum and, and it took the driver two and a half days to get from california to reno that's about 700 miles so you know but the donner pass was closed we had to wait and we had to put chains on i mean it was it was the weather has been challenging this year it has been you know. we, we mentioned it's like a puzzle um none of the cars are the same shape size um anything but they're they all are extremely valuable mm -hmm. so in order to get them in hold them in place is there anything special that has to be done well our trailers are all designed to do this kind of work okay. um, so we've got articulating decks inside so we can adjust the angles whatever and then we use all nylon secured straps. So we strap over the tires. We'll strap a strap over the frame to hold it down. Um, so there's a variety of ways, depending on what type of car it is, how you tie it down. But yeah, we, we take extra precautions to make sure that that's taken care of, yes. What's been the, the car that you have traveled, um, that you transported, that was the m you were most concerned about? Uh, Last year, we took from the RM sale in Monterey, we took the $44 million Ferrari 250. So <laughs> Does your insurance uh, policy cover that? Uh, well, believe it or not, <laughs> and that's a big selling point for reliable carriers. Uh, you know, We carry the highest amount of standard coverage in the industry, but we have the ability to go as high as $65 million. Oh, my goodness. So uh, that car went by itself. Uh, and was insured for $44 million. I can imagine that you wouldn't want to put anything no, else No, we didn't put anything it. else with that one. No, Obviously, no. We, we talk about Reliable as being very much at the forefront of, of what you now do, but what's the history? Where, where, does, the, where does the company come from? Well, we started, we, we've been in business since 1960. Uh, we're a family-owned business, uh, been the same family from the beginning till now. Uh, we started out as a moving and storage business, believe it or not. And at one time, we were the fifth largest allied van line agent in the United States. That's where the orange trucks came from. Uh, and then in 1986, we pretty much made the decision that we were going to go into the car business full-time. We were dabbling in it. And uh, so we exited the household business and went into this business full-time. And uh, so the rest, as they say, is history. Why cars? Uh, you know, a couple things. One is the owners of our company are passionate about cars, so they have great interest in it. Um, and from a business perspective, to be perfectly honest with you, we could make a lot more money hauling cars than we could household goods. Right. So, <laughs> so some of it was a monetary decision in terms of, you know, what made the most sense. Uh, 
and then like I said it kind of went from there and, and now we're blessed we, we do business with every manufacturer in the world um, this you know we do all the concours we do a lot of the major auctions so you know our, anything is automotive related we're doing it you know so if it's got four wheels and can go on a trailer the chances are we're, we're dealing with it so I know you walked around a little bit. Last question for you. Did you pick a favorite? Do you have a show favorite? No, I did not. You know, I, I must be honest with you that part of the craziness of this is that I'm on the phone most of the time uh -huh. and I'm doing this. So, you know, I'm a big Porsche guy, though, so I probably would have picked one of the 962s or very something nice. like that. I, you know, I, I like Porsche, so. Very, very nice. And we have Alan DeCatene, um, who's part of our Putnam Leasing um, field crew out there now. Well, I like Porsches too, uh, especially the 356. But the jewel in the crown for any 356 person has to be what we call a Gmunt coupe. Gmunt in Austria is where the very, very first 356s were built. This is a 1951 car. They differ from the cars that were built in Stuttgart later because they have all aluminum bodies. Everything you see, handmade out of aluminum. It's got an early 1500cc super engine in there. And this car, believe it or not, this actual car, went to Montlhery circuit and did 72 hours running around an average 97 or 96, I think, 0.44 miles for the 72 hours. I mean, that was unbelievable to do that. But it's a very simple car. It's only got three instruments. There's a speedo, there's a rev counter, and there's an oil pressure gauge. And that's all you need. But it was the success of these Gamunt coupes that convinced the Porsche family that they should open up shop in Stuttgart in Germany. That's where they went to make the rest of the 356s. That's where they still are today. But I can tell you, in my whole lifetime, this is only the second one of these I've ever seen. And the other one was in the Porsche Museum in Stuttgart. We may be historicracingnews.com, but right now we're going to be a, give you a bit of history, full stop. This Gordini Simca has got an amazing story. This is a Formula One car, competed in the 1948 French Grand Prix at Reims. That was before the World, Ch World Ch Formula One Championship even existed. The owner we've got over here, Ray Morgan, Ray has got a fantastic story about how this car came about, how it was built. Ray, this is quite a story about what this car was before it was even a car. Exactly. If you can imagine being 1946, 1947, right after the war, no raw materials, Europe's in devastation. And so all of a sudden there's all these war planes and they're downed all over Europe. And so in France, there happened to be a downed Metzerschmitt that became the bones for this car. Somebody went out, pulled the panels off of it, the wings and so forth, and as a result, it became this racing car. Now. To make that make sense, you have to look at what would have been the markings on a, uh, an airplane of that vintage. And you'll see the German Iron Cross, which is located under the bottom of the wing and on the side panel of the fuselage. And you'll notice the way it's all rounded in the front. Well, these pieces became really important in building a car because if you can imagine that it was gonna look like this, what would you think if you saw the bottom of it today and there's the iron cross and oh, wow. this is the actual panel bullet holes and all wow. so the iron cross was located in this area still documented on this car today and that engine covers off as message is that right engine cover as well the same thing why remake it it's already bent aluminum and available so off it goes and it becomes a car which at that time Formula One, Formula Two, and Formula Three were all in those early days yeah. of reformulation. This is a Formula Two car. It was a Formula Two car because it has a production engine and a complete production driveline, but the body, the brakes, the suspension, and so forth, those can be modified. And Gordini was quite the sorcerer. He was a guy who was ingenious with tuning. He'd grown up with the likes of Ferrari and Metzer Schmidt and a guy named Weber and he could tune and make lawnmower motors go fast if they'd had such a thing. But anyway, he was so good at it 
that he made these Gordinis. And his drivers were Juan Fangio and Perron, Verón and the like. Rip, we're going to head across to the shore field for a moment. But if you guys come back to us, we've got a bit more interest about the guys who actually drove this car. And this is uh, something you don't see every day. <laughs> <laughs> you just heard the, the horn blow, the Stanley, 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 Stanley steamer, yeah. Yeah, so talk about what sums up the Amelia Island, Island Concorde d'Elegance, that we just saw a Rothmans Porsche 962 pull away That's from it. the presentation <laughs> stage, and it was replaced by a Stanley steamer. Huge plumes of steam, of course, not smoke. No. Steam coming out of there. You can hear the, it. Uh, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's like a 1950s uh, railway that's, uh, that's going up there. But nonetheless, it looks great. It's um, maybe maybe if we'd gone a different way and we'd all end up running steam cars, maybe. the world would be in a different place. <laughs> but, uh, looks great. Lots and lots of steam. And we uh, we heard the, the blast of the whistle yes. as, uh, as that came into stage. And then... Right behind it, we have kind of a similar kind of period, but once again, a Rolls-Royce. And that this is the, uh, the four-seater. Mm -hmm. um, Jamie, you and I talked earlier on about those huge non-LED headlamps. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, Look uh, how big those are. Some of the cars that, that come through, you know, that instead of having the two big ones, they'll have, I mean, I counted eight <laughs> on, the, on the front of, of one of them. Because it was it was all in its infancy, and I think right. that's that's something that is hard to get your head round. Is that these cars, everything was starting new, yep. that everything was from scratch, and that people didn't know the answers to some of the questions. That's why you've got those huge Lucas headlights on the front of that car. Because if if we're producing a car which is a luxurious and b quite quick then we need to put huge, great headlights on the front because that's the only way we know to do it. It's, what's interesting to me when you look at some of, of these cars and look at the back seat of, of that one, it's, you think about a chair from, from that era. You know, you, we've all gone to antique stores and you've sat in these chairs and, and you sit down and you, there's no room. Like how did people sit on these chairs? They were so <laughs> tiny. But then you look at the cars and they had these seats that were big enough for people to actually ride in the car. Yeah, and... and Four people in that car with ease. You could uh, you could cruise in that all day. I am quite sure of that. And uh, that we're seeing we're seeing quite a lot of what I think I'm going to call canary yellow <laughs> cars today. And uh, here comes yet another one. And another look one. on the uh, on the driver's right hand side of that, where you have an extra seat. You have it on the passenger. Um, oh, and the, the other passenger side as well. As well yep. Um, now, how exposed would you feel oh <laughs> driving down a stony road in, uh, in that seat that Can actually folds out from the side? I would not personally want to sit there because I have preconceived notions of um, crashing and things running into me. My four-year-old, however, would love to sit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Fa faster, mummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it would be exactly that. But I, I think we, yeah, it, it, you don't need to have too much imagination not to want to sit there. Right. Um, and and that that would uh, that would absolutely be it. But again, it's this thing that. There was no preconceived idea of where you put you your passengers. Right. So let's put them on the outside. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. It'll be fine. <laughs> Particularly if I'm giving, giving a ride to people I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As this one pulls away, we'll go uh, back to Joe Bradley, a piece that he actually shot earlier. It's um, with the cannonball, and uh, Bill Warner was a part of it. And here, take a listen. Here in North Florida, the Amelia Island Concorde d'Elegance is an event that's not to be missed. And the man behind that is the man to my right here, Bill Warner. And how can I say this? Uh, I'm going to be polite. One of Bill's competitors in his motorsport life is right next to him, uh, Jack May. Jack, Bill, um, how can you guys still be friends, especially you, but I'm going to ask you this one. Didn't he beat you in the 1975 Cannonball Run? Well, uh Soundly, yes, <laughs> soundly. But, but I got all the glory because he, he, they were doing the shot on the roof of the Red Ball Garage. 
and they had all the cars lined up, and his white Dino was front and center. The car that's behind us here. Well, it was leaking fuel, so had, they had to run out and fix it, and they needed a white car, so they put my Porsche 911. See, so I got pole position. I got all the glory. I got the cover of car and driver, but he won the race. And it's... Um, we thought about photoshopping it to fix it, but we've not done it they, yet. They didn't have photoshop <laughs> back then. Jack, I believe you won that race by a, a full 11 hours. I mean, it's a coast to coast uh, from starting in uh, Dockland in the Bronx all the way to California. And you did that with an, uh, and you, it, you ended up with an 11-hour lead and an average speed Never of eight. An 11-hour lead. That's, I've been given that information. What was it, Jack? Well, you, the record? 11 hours over me. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> Remember, Bill. I was a day and a half over Tolly, right? <laughs> yeah. Never let the truth grow in the way of a good story. Now, 11 hours. Now, 83 mile an hour average from coast to coast in continental and North America. You would have even gone faster if it wasn't for those pesky uh, cops in Ohio. Ohio. Ohio, was it? Ohio put me in jail. <laughs> what happened? No sense of humor at all. <laughs> <laughs> what speed were they, did they clock you at? Oh, uh, I think they, I think about 120. The funniest one, wouldn't you say Tolly? Yeah. Tolly got arrested in uh, what, West, West Virginia? Virginia. Charleston, West Virginia. And they'd picked up this uh, teeny bopper who was going to help him, help him get across town. town. And the cops thought that they were uh, maybe picking her up and <laughs> took them to jail. They, they he got, was a whole day late. They, were, they, they got arrested for suspicion of violation of the Mann Act, which was transporting uh, underage, uh, underage children across state lines for immoral purposes. <laughs> so they finished last. <laughs> I think on that note, we'll leave it there for these guys to continue with these funny tales. Thanks for putting the time aside to talk to us and, and just sharing that experience. It's brilliant. Uh, Jack, it's always a pleasure to be with you, my friend. It's always good. It was, this was the Florida contingent here. Right. Both have our cars that ran the cannonball. You yeah. never get rid of a good, good car. No, no, you no. You marry a good woman and you keep a good car. And it's good. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to go on that note, surely. <laughs> Gen genuine laughter there from, oh, from the three of them. Let's go back to Joe Bradley. We saw Jackie Ix autograph the poster earlier today, and it's time, I believe, Joe, to, to hand that out. Hey, Cock Insurance has been part of the Amelia Island Concord for some years. Pete Doraguzzi here is going to tell us why. Pete, why is an event like this so important for your company? Joe, we've been a part of this since uh, 23 years ago, one year after the Amelia Island Concourse was actually started. Guys, I don't know if you can actually hear what Pete's saying, but the, we're being drowned out by a March 83G, which doesn't happen very often. No, it doesn't. But, uh, so, start again. Tell us again. No, so, Fort Haycock started here 23 years ago, uh, supporting the Bill Warner and the Mealy Island Concourse, uh, one year after its initial uh, inauguration. We've been here every year since. Um, this is a big deal for us. We get to see many, many clients here every year, and this is a good kickoff to the year. This is, um, has become a, a signature event for us as a, as a company. Uh, we sponsor the, the Haycock Classic Cars and Coffee on Saturday on the show field here, and then Sunday here on the Concourse, and we uh, Again, love being here. This has been such a fantastic part of our history. Um, and, and, and is this a place where you can actually um, create business, or, or is it uh, purely marketing and raising people's awareness to ACOG insurance? Joe, it's a good question. It's actually a lot of everything that we do. It's uh, solidifying current relationships, also meeting new people and new prospects, and, uh, and getting an idea of what we're going to be selling for the future here. There are a lot of auctions that go on. Uh, we take a look at the market rates of, of vehicles throughout the weekend, um, but again, it's a it's a place for us to do a lot of things with our business. Again, meeting clients, meeting prospects, and, and solidifying relationships we currently have. And it, again, fantastic, fantastic of event here that that we get to do it all in one weekend. And we've got a, a very special um, occurrence about to take place. It's the draw. It's the prize is a signed Amelia Island Concord poster, and it's signed by our honorary Jackie Yakes. It is, and, and we're going to do a, a drawing here today. We've, we've had people registering all weekend long, and uh, we'd like to draw that. And actually, we're going to have uh, Cannonball Jack, the car that you see back behind us here, the, the car that won the Cannonball in 1975, set the record at 35 hours and 53 minutes. Uh, Jack May was here, to, and he's going to do the drawing for us and pick the winner. 
And now, if, if Jack's, Jack's here also, so we're going to be able to do this live, if you give us a second. And Jack's ready to make the draw for the prize. Jack, hi. We spoke Hello, yesterday yes, and we had yes. some great fun. In fact, I think we had too much fun yesterday. <laughs> I think they're not going to let us get together again. Here we go. And the well, prize is for the... Some of my good luck. Yeah. Whoever gets this. Good luck of being arrested and being let out, I think. <laughs> good name. Jack Molière. Uh, we've, we've got a phone number there. So Mr. Jack Molière. And we've got his email and uh, his phone number. And... Uh, that's going to be that. So that's our winner. Jamalier is now the, uh, the the owner of a, a signed poster signed by honorary Jack EX. Pete, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, we're glad you've been around and uh, continue to be a partner in the Amelia Island Concord. And Jack, it's just an absolute honour to talk to talk to you. Talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We get another Packard into uh, into stage now. I think. Uh, Looking lovely. You're you're a Packard expert, so uh, does that look like a Packard to you? I, was that the goddess of speed on the front of it? It's a goddess, yeah, that's yes. for sure. Um, but, um, it is the Packard, yes. Um, wouldn't call myself a Packard expert, but I do have a Packard story. I told you at the beginning of our of our coverage here um, that I have a soft spot in my heart for them, and it goes back to 2007. Uh, my husband Brian and I we were getting married in Dayton, Ohio. And the only requirement that I had for our wedding was that I wanted it to be in the summer. But of course, being involved in motorsports, him racing, me starting in broadcasting, we had to work around various race schedules. We had one weekend available. And Dayton, Ohio, believe it or not, is a very popular place <laughs> in the summer. And we had a very difficult time finding um, a, a location for our reception. And we ended up walking through downtown Dayton and we ended at the American Packard Museum, which is the, a Packard, <laughs> it's the Packard Museum um, as well as a working garage. And they had no catering, um, they had no, no bar, um, but they rented us a facility, get this, $500 was wow. our rental fee. Uh, we brought in our own catering, we brought in our own bartenders, our own um, beverages, and we got to, Brian and I got to walk through and pick out which cars we had sent, um, represented front and center. We yep. had um, beautiful, some, you know, gangster cars from the, from the 20s, and um, and then our guests got to tour the museum as well. The The floor was a checkered flag floor. It was dirty because, as I said, it is a working garage. But I've always had a soft spot for, for Packard. And I didn't, I mean, to be honest with you, before that, I didn't know a whole lot about Packard. But it was a fantastic place for a wedding. It just sounds so good, so <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm, you, you cannot think of any, anywhere better for a... Uh, for a racing journalist and a racing driver yes. to get married than, than in, a, in a car museum. And presumably, some of the cars that we've seen here, you'd have seen that type of car. Yes. Uh, oh, that's yes. great. Yep. They that's were, uh, some of them, a lot of them did not run um, because it is, it's almost a storage facility. They're all in various stages of, of restoration, um, but many of them did. We actually, um, there was one, I don't remember what year it was, but it was it was blue. It had been restored um, to not a, a period color. And they, they backed it in, they opened the back of it, and that was our gift table. So all the <laughs> gifts went into the, the back of one. Well, wh when we were walking around earlier on, we uh, we were swapping stories of, of this, that, and, and, and the other. and. I was saying to you that we we were looking at the cars of Jackie Eakes, mm -hmm. and I can remember as a child we were going on vacation, and it was the day of the German Grand Prix, and I was badgering my parents to say we've got to find out who won the, the German <laughs> Grand Prix, and that my uh, my mother got sufficiently bored with me that she. Uh, she gave me a, a small amount of cash and sent me off. No, no, uh, no cell phones, of course, in of those course. days. Right. So uh, you could not fact, Google it. In fact, <laughs> yeah, I think the phone had only just been invented. But uh, <laughs> that sent me off to uh, to find a payphone, and I phoned uh, the London Times and said, uh, "Can you tell me, please, uh, who won the German Grand Prix?" And the news desk duly told me, and. If you had said all these years later that I would be standing in front of the car when they said, Jackie Eakes won it in a Brabham, then uh, I would not have believed you. <laughs> but he won that race in that very car, which is, uh, which is out there on the show field today. 
What a great story. That's great. I cannot imagine today somebody calling the newspaper to ask them who won a particular race. No, no. Times have changed yes. very, very much. Yes. This is the, the best interior, the Connolly Leather Trophy, most outstanding interior, we should say. Uh, yeah, and and the we can the exterior looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's um, that's very much a Rolls Royce made for state occasions, isn't it? With that big high rear roof that uh, so that people can be seen as well as to see. And uh, is that why it's like that? I think so. Yeah, yeah. That you big big windows so drive you drive through to wave wave, and wave to the crowd. Yeah. Um, interesting. The and, Phantom uh, Five. So yeah, very much the car of, besides many other things, the uh, the UK's royal family, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that yeah, I mean we're we're getting to some really mouth-watering cars now, and and that they are absolutely fabulous. That, that but does that look like a, a Cadillac badge on the front of that? I believe car, it is. Jamie? Yes, I, I think it may yeah, well be. I believe it is. Um, I think this is a best in class for one of the Cadillac classes. Our um, our sequence of award has has uh, become out of sequence. And as I as I mentioned before, we are sitting um, we're virtually at the the front of that car. Uh, about what what would you say that is? It's probably twenty, 20 feet. Twenty feet. Yeah. 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 Um, so that is yeah. best in class for the American Classic from 1930. We now know thanks to our uh, producer. Mr. Jim Roller, who, if, if you followed along in sports car racing in the last, oh, what? 150 <laughs> years. <laughs> since you, you know that Stanley Steamer that we saw? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that was actually I, I won't say that about our esteemed <laughs> producer. That, that was <laughs> he that taught was actually me a lot of what I know. <laughs> that was actually competing <laughs> in Jim's first race. <laughs> He's been a around with uh, motorsports broadcasting for a very long time. We're lucky to have him guiding us today, um, even, even when we are out of sequence. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's very true that we uh, we wouldn't know where we are. We'd uh, we'd be e even even further up a gum tree than we are now. <laughs> oh, look at the uh, look at the hood motif on that car. Uh, that's again fabulous. I mean, terribly terribly politically incorrect now because if you're a passenger, if you're a pedestrian, and you get hit by that, you're going to hurt. know all about <laughs> it, aren't you? You'd have some headlights that got to you first, though. <laughs> oh, that's all right then. <laughs> <laughs> mixed mixed metals is coming back into style. You saw the brass and the chrome yep, um, on yep. that one, and so it's it's becoming cool again. Oh, well if it ever went out of style, I'm not sure. No, uh, prob probably not. Not that one. I think we we are now just um, bamboozled by the amount of hood motifs that are coming around the corner at us because that was very much part of the thing. And and in the 30s, of course, you had your own that you would go to your jeweler. You did? Would, yeah. Who I would did not know that. Create you. I mean, if you were... Like a family it, crest? Or, or you might you might say it was just a, a very pretty, uh, you know, the, the, the beautiful woman or the mermaid or, or whatever. And if we look at that uh, Pierce Arrow that's... Model 133, that's now, best in class, right. yep. American classics. I mean, the Pierce Arrow. You know, that, yep. That... That just has one of those names, doesn't it? Uh, that can you imagine being at a 1930s cocktail party with all that that means <laughs> and everything that that has? And, and somebody says, "Well, what do you drive?" I drive a Pierce Arrow. I mean, that that just says it all, doesn't it? You're I like the military coloring on it as yeah. well. Yeah, that's that's good. Now we're we're going right back in time. Back in time. Now, uh, that the horseless carriage. Yes, the absolutely the horseless carriage, and uh, that just needing a little bit of uh, of, <laughs> of human D different kind of power here. Yep, yeah, <laughs> and uh, yes, much 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 better gas mileage yes. with this car. It's probably the most efficient car that we've seen so far today, but only by the fact that there are four people behind it pushing it. But uh, oh, and they've got it started. There they have go. got it. Oh, well done. Uh, that this is. Um, this is right back from the dawn of motoring time. It just needed a push start. That's all it was. <laughs> That's all it was. And uh, that look, look at that. We've, we've talked about the, the horseless carriage. Wooden wheels, artillery wheels, solid tires. Uh, th this is a carriage. It's, mm -hmm. it's nothing more than that. And 
that we know that they were not universally adopted or liked, that, that an awful lot of people saw them as the, uh, the work of the devil. And Black magic. Yes, yes, all, all of that. And of course, they, they created an awful lot of dust, they, um, which people weren't used to. Um, that there was, there was a mantra um, back at the time that if you traveled at more than 60 miles an hour, which these cars wouldn't have done, but if you traveled at more than 60 miles an hour, your head would blow off. <laughs> and, uh, and so you know, that these cars would have been flat out at probably 25. But, but nonetheless, you know, this fear of, of where the world was going right. is, uh, is just so different. Yeah. And that, I that is completely a horseless carriage. And uh, you can hear the, 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 the putter of the, of the engine. It's uh, not doing anything very much. You know, it's um, we watch them push it to get it started, and, and you think there can't be many of them left that run. No. Right. And so you wonder uh, who who is going, who's learning to fix them, because the the the, the people who maintain them now certainly won't be a, around forever. And are those lessons being passed down? Will will my kids get to sit here one day and watch a horseless carriage running? I think it's a very very good point. Uh, that many of the people who are involved in in the restoration or the maintenance of of old cars of any age mm -hmm. um, are, will tell you that it's a dying art that, that kids begin to sound my age now kids don't want to do it right. that, um, they there is somebody explained it to me once is there is a difference between a mechanic and a fitter and a fitter just takes off a broken part and puts a new one on whereas a mechanic can rework it, can repair it, and you cannot go down to your local store and buy the bits for right. this. So it's, it's all of those kind of things which, which you just have to accept. And that uh, Joe Bradley, part of our Putnam Leasing field team, has, uh, has an interesting guest for us. What an event this has been. Uh, you're one of our judges. Uh, tell me firstly, what, are the, what is the class that you've been judging well, it was uh, sports cars and uh, and races, really, from 50 to 54, right. 51 to 54. A very enjoyable day for you? Yeah, super nice. I mean, the variety of cars this year is, again, touching something which is, just looking behind me here, unbelievable. And um, it's getting better every year. It's fantastic. You know, the quality of, the sheer quality of cars which come out from the dungeons, um, you know, it's... It's quite amazing and of course you know the more value they have and the more come and that's great you know and of course this Amelia just beautifully runs so that's great. Yesterday Jochen I was at the seminar on the Porsche 962 what a mix of people um, that you know to be able to be reunited with that era and those cars what what are your fond memories if you indeed you have any fond memories of that era? I have very fond memories because it was a very nice time to race I must say the cars were brilliant they were brilliant, you know. We the first time I drove it, I couldn't talk about it yesterday. Um, the first time I drove was in Le Castellet, south of France, and I drove the 936. Then we parked it, and then we got the 956, and I got into the car and acquainted myself. And the first corner, normally, it was a very fast S, left right, and uh, with the 936, you had to be very very accurate to do it flat. So you could do it, but you had to be precise. With that car, I hadn't even noticed the corner. I drove through and, uh, you know, the first time out and then the next lap and you think, where the hell is the corner, excuse my French, yeah. and um, it was amazing, so, uh, and then racing with Jackie, of course, except Le Mans, but Le Mans was a different story, I opted against Le Mans for, for various reasons, because every time I looked around on the Fridays in briefing, I said, who is it this time, we always lost the guy, and uh, so, and the safety, the active safety, guardrail fixings, things like that, were not up to scratch. And the pit, the pit lane was too narrow. And so on. I often spoke to the organizers, they were nice, but they were FIA independent, so they did what they wanted. So they didn't want to spend the money for whatever alterations they would have had to do, in my opinion, but they didn't do it. So in my contract with Porsche was always all the races, of course, but Le Mans. So that's why Derek drove with Jackie. Johan, pleasure as always to talk to you. I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of the show. Uh, your work is done as a judge and uh, we'll talk to you again, no doubt.
Very good. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Now we see um, another. This is the Tony Holman Award winner with Rob Dyson. We talked about him uh, yeah. Dysonizing his cars. <laughs> this one, <laughs> this one does not look as Dysonized. No, this uh, is uh, this is his car. This is the Extract Rubham car, which uh, which came over and really kind of started the whole move to the rear engine um, revolution that it came as it. Let's listen in to what this is about. Because it had independent suspension and a rear engine, very little horsepower, but Jack Brabham still finished ninth at the Indianapolis 561, and everybody said, whoa, we've got to build our cars like that, and it's, that's what's happening now, has been for, since then. Well, clearly, I mean, and we're honored to be here and, and to get an award like this from the Speedway Museum is really an honor, and, and I'm just proud that we've been able to get this car going, and we'll, you'll be able to see it in the museum once we get through it. So that's, it's a, it's, this is living heritage, and you're absolutely right, John. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how honored we are to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Johnny Rutherford, ladies and gentlemen. And that is Johnny Rutherford uh, presenting that award to Rob Dyson. He's a three-time winner winner at the Indianapolis 500, so a great honor, as, as Rob said, for him. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to uh, things that made the change. And uh, that, yeah, that, that uh, Cooper really changed the world. But uh, Alan de Cazanet, part of our uh, part of our Putnam Leasing field team, is out on out on the field, but before we, we go, shiny. before we, before <laughs> we go, oh. yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, we've, uh, this one's bright, <laughs> we have, we have something which is coming onto the field yes. now, which is, um, we, which is the other end of the scale, we just saw the Cooper coming on, which kind of started a revolution, and this car did as well, we talked about how Colin Chapman changed the world so many times with the cars that he produced, and this is one of them, the uh, the 1968 gas turbine powered Lotus IndyCar, and it's not just about the gas turbine on here, although <laughs> that would be enough. But just look at the car. It's it's at a time when people were kind of playing around with aerodynamics. They were looking at tell. just how they mm -hmm. were, but there's there's no there's no big wing on the back. Uh, the car is the wing, and that it's it's just everything it is that it, this begat, obviously, the the Lotus 72, which was hugely successful in single seater Grand Prix racing, but this car with its turbo and uh, with its turbine engine in the back, completely different box of frogs. Box of frogs. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that expression. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I, I, I have more. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful car, and the, the color on it. Yeah. Is well, that was the, um, the STP Andy Granatelli uh, sponsorship showing mm -hmm. on on that car. Uh, we've talked a bit about how cars changed at Indy, and that we now have coming into stage the 1963. Watson Indy, which was really the beginning of the end of the of, of the Indy Roadsters. That's a Goodyear tires on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, obviously front engined um, that has a lot of similarities with a, with a, a dirt car in in so many ways. You can see that what huge is turbocharger out of the side. <laughs> Um, and uh, that that's that's really quite something. I think we can now go and uh, join our field team, powered by Putnam Leasing and Alain de Cadenet. Thank you very much for that. I found a rather remarkable machine. It's the 1954 Arno Bristol, and so it's got a Bristol engine in there, which, as you may remember was really a BMW 328 engine that they we got the license for after World War II. So Bristol built them. And S Stanley uh, Arno, who was known as Wacky, 
because uh, <laughs> I've just discovered, they said, why don't you row a boat across Lake Michigan, Stanley? And he did, for no good reason other than they told him. So they then decided that he was wacky. So he's known as Wacky Arno. But the beauty of this car, it has a Bertoni body on it. And when you look at the lines of the body, uh, the actual molding that comes along the top of the door, it slopes away to nothing and then it picks up again as it comes to the rear wing. So your eyeball fills in the middle bit that's missing. It looks like there's a line all the way down, but in fact, there, there isn't. But it's a beautiful looking car. It's one of the, I think, what's it won here? An award, uh, I'm not sure quite what it was for, but these are rare. I mean, they are very rare. You occasionally see one in England. Sometimes you see them here in North America. But th this is a beautiful car, quite the nicest one I've ever seen. And if you've been listening to our coverage of the, an the 24th annual Amelia Island Concord at Elegance, the live stream presented by Reliable Carriers, you would have heard us ask the question earlier of where Wacky Arnold came from, and now we know. And now we know, and uh, that we've, we just saw the, the Lotus coming through with the turbine engine, but now in stage we have something completely <laughs> different, which is a Cummins diesel Indy car. And... Uh, very, very different. Obviously, it was something which, which again, could have changed the world, didn't, but right. could have done. And that it's back to this thing of innovation. It's back to this thing where people say, do you know, it might just work. So let's give it a go. And that uh, I'm trying to work out how long it is. My maths is not good enough, but it's probably 50 years later that we started seeing diesel-powered sports cars. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and how successful were they? Yep. Extremely successful. One 24 hours of Le Mans year after year um, until the hybrid technology, of course, came into existence. So. Right, and now we have the March 83, 83G, which uh, is coming now into field. <laughs> Uh, oh, and listen to that noise. Which is significant because it's the best sound on the field. This is the Borla Award. <laughs> listen to that. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I could listen to that all day. Uh, and uh, that it's, it just has all the right noise. It has all the right stuff. This car, as we heard earlier, designed very, very early in his career by Adrian Newey, who has gone on to design cars principally in Formula One for everybody from Williams through McLaren and now Red Bull. And uh, here comes the, the tro trophy making its own noise. How oh, cool. It's uh, quite, quite something to, to <laughs> see all that. Um, decorated in the colors of the spirit of Miami. I wonder if it runs on batteries. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what's going to make a hell of a doorbell, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> is that great? That is a very, very cool trophy. Yep. So, uh, not not only uh, making lots of wonderful noises, but it looks fabulous mm -hmm. as well. And uh, that we can we can see that with the March 83 G. So. What, whatever whatever that you, you want it to say, it can say. So they will no doubt program that trophy to make March 83G type noises um, as and when they, they get round to that. But a real treat. Um, driven, as we, as we know, by Emerson Fittipaldi. Uh, it was only um, two years ago that we saw Adrian Newey, who is... Um, he has racing in his veins. He's not just a boffin. And that he actually raced uh, an earlier version of that car at Daytona. Uh, and he had the surprise, which um, perhaps it's not always designers that get the surprise, that the, uh, the rear tire let go on the banking at Daytona and uh, really made him think about, uh, think about looking at his laundry and deciding exactly what he was going to do about that. 
I'm, I'm watching as um, <laughs> this young man is, is about to climb back into the car. He had to pass off the trophy because there's no room for it <laughs> as, he, as he drives away. Let's go back down to, to Alan DeCatney and our field, part of our field team powered by Putnam Leasing. What I have found is uh, the most wonderful little MG, it, which is short for Morris Garages. It's a J2 and very similar to the first car that I ever bought myself in England. I paid five guineas, which is five pounds, five shillings for mine. And what was really brilliant about it was once I paid the money, the guy I bought it from said, well, now you've bought the car, my boy, I want to tell you a little secret. Have a look down there. And he pointed down underneath the steering wheel and there was a switch there. And I said, whoa, yes, can you see the switch? He said, yes. I said, well, what's that for? He said, well, my boy, there's no hood to this car, so when you've got your girlfriend next door to you and you're going down the street, if you flip that button there and she's cold, she'll have to give you a cuddle. And I thought, oh, oh, I see. This is obviously a good car to have. But I learned more about cars from this MG than anything else I've really had since. You know, it had its overhead cam, it had its, uh, its four-cylinder engine, 850 cc. I learned how to adjust the tappets, set the ignition. I fell in love with that car, but eventually I had to sell it. I sold it for six pounds. I made 15 shillings profit. <laughs> Can you still hear me, Alan? Can you hear this me, Alan? This is a beauty. You see. <clears throat> No. Oh. Oh, I bet he has some him. great memories. I want to know what his best memory was with that car. <laughs> I'm not sure you're <laughs> going to get it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure whether that entailed taking the hood down or not. <laughs> good points, good points. But, um, yeah, and now we have... Uh, we <coughs> have uh, oh, <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps can we can you hear get, us, uh, Alan? get him back in. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so, so we were talking um, earlier about the way that people feel about these cars, and you, you speak so romantically about this one. What was your best memory with this one? Well, I'd have to tell you <laughs> privately <laughs> later, because this, this is now, we're talking about further education for you, <laughs> Jamie, and I would have to be very careful what I said. Mixed, but, mixed have, audience, I understand. What occurred was not uninteresting, but it didn't occur in the car, <laughs> as you can see. They're very snug, these machines, but there's no room for shenanigans. All right. I think uh, on the basis that there's no room for shenanigans, we'll move on, but uh, yes. I think I think actually Mr. De Cadenet has made it perfectly clear to everybody what did go on, but thank you very much I think much he was indeed. blushing out there on the concourse. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. We've, uh, we've just seen a, a few beautiful um, Volkswagen Beetle type things um, going around, and uh, here's one coming into stage now. Of course, the the Beetle itself lent itself to all sorts of different styles. It begat the um, the dune buggy because it was it was such a an easy car to modify that you could just chop the the bodywork off off a Beetle. And did you own one? Um, very briefly before it rusted away um, but uh, the dune buggy was was just the way it is and when you, when you think of think oh th this is where you are going to think that I am a dinosaur but things like Steve McQueen and the uh, Thomas Crown affair and, and those sorts of films where he drives Faye Dunaway across the across the beach in the water in a dune buggy that's yeah. that that was the height of cool for me um sadly i never quite got to that just got to rusty but cars but you had one uh, yeah <laughs> but uh yeah only rusty cars um, but this one is not rusty far from it um but very much a a rebody of the of the Ger german mark um but we're we're getting some some good cars now lined up to come onto the show field as as we have all day I mean, this just hasn't stopped it Jamie, hasn't has no it? no it, we i mean we got started a little bit a little behind schedule but once once we got going it's it this is just i have we haven't left no <laughs> we haven't left our seats nor have you wanted to <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, and i think that sometimes with these kind of things you get to the stage where you think well yeah we 
we've had the best right. and now we're but every time you look away and you look back and here's uh, here's the the next car and believe it or not that car underneath there is a vw vehicle no let's uh, go to joe bradley with jackie Eakes. Uh, how have you enjoyed your time here at the amelia island concord frankly amelia island was a discovery for me i was told about amelia all the comments were very nice um, it was a kind of adventure in a way to go in a somewhere you haven't been before it was a, a hell of a surprise to see the result and to discover such a good team with Bill Warner leading it and uh, I like to say that there are many similarities between uh, the event of uh, Goodwood Revival Festival with uh, Charles of uh, Richmond. I think they have the same perception and the race, the same respect for their guests, well, I call them their guests because when you come in, whoever you are, you are treated uh, like a guest with respect and the result is, is when you go home in the evening you're happy and you smile whatever the weather is i mean we have been lucky here okay but that's pure happiness and it demonstrates that it demonstrates that you can do a business in a human way yeah very passionate business now that's it. Talk, talking about that passion jackie Bill's team put together and provided you with the unique experience of seeing cars that you've driven throughout your career laid out in front of you. I shared that moment with you and you said this will never happen again. For sure. I mean, they've spent a lot of energy to find some car I've driven and that I haven't seen for ages. He find them. It took the... Uh, um, the personal desire to succeed on that and to bring them here. When I say it won't happen, happen again, clearly it's so difficult. And also maybe I don't come here uh, next year. So, But it's a matter of sensitivity. If you look at uh, Bill Warner and his team, the way they are thinking, he paid a lot of attention to everyone. He knows that he pays a lot of attention on the details, like uh, Charles of uh, Richmond does it. Yeah. And that's the reason why there is a, such an atmosphere, such a soul uh, here, and where you are, why you are able to re reunite it. People coming from different places, uh, in the United States, outside, abroad, sharing the same passion. And then to have the passion for mobility, car, design, vintage, classic, it's very important in a human life. Thank you, Jack. It's been a pleasure to meet you. And I'm sure we'll see you back again as one of our judges, maybe. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. I listened to him talk several times this week, and I think he may be back. I think he may. And, and the other thing that came out of that was that I'm lucky enough to count Bill Warner as a friend, and that I know that what Jackie just said about the comparison between here and Goodwood will make a huge difference to Bill. He'll be very, very flattered by that. This is the Volkswagen of America winner, uh, the award being presented right now. I, just, I, I like this color. I like all of it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, can, can, you, can you see the original wheels underneath there? The, uh, 1951. Do you think... You think those are the original? Yeah, they, they look yeah. like uh, beetle wheels and beetle hubcaps. But I think if if I didn't know th what th what this was, then I'd say that almost certainly you know that was anything but a Volkswagen Beetle, a 1951 car. I'm going to let you say the the full name. No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for Rump, thanks Rumpskow. for <laughs> thanks for that, Jamie. I'll really appreciate that. Um, and uh, now. Sublime and ridiculous both come to mind. Um, All on one car. It's uh, this is quite something we've seen. I've seen a couple of woodies come through already today, and this is uh, this is a very very futuristic 
Um, drop dead gorgeous, I have to say, Carl. Um, the candy paint really adds something. It does, yeah. <laughs> um, no, if you're going to go over the top, you go might just go over yes, the top. Yes. And that's what they've uh, that's what they've done with this. And uh, but say, so looking looking great, looking completely and utterly impractical. It, it, looking at the screen, it it looks like a drawing. It yes. doesn't look like it could be a real car sitting there like that. Yeah, yeah. There's somebody has walked into a design studio mm -hmm. and said, "I've got a great idea," and everybody's gone, "Oh no, not again." <laughs> another uh, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> another Madden. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, looking looking great, and that that also ought to have surfboards on the roof, shouldn't it? That's you think? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, this is perhaps a little bit too beautiful. I th yeah, this one I picture. Um, Taking to a, a ball, or you, s you yeah. step out of it in an evening gown and a tuxedo. Yeah. Plus, yeah, it doesn't have I the roof that. rack. You would ruin the paint. Well that <laughs> 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 yeah, that's all true. That's all true. So uh, yeah, we'll 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 settle for uh, going to the prom. Uh, look at those wheels oh, on that's that. That's beautiful. That's fabulous. Absolutely. See the color change as it goes. Different lights. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. But that car is uh, is actually somewhere underneath that, Jamie. It's a 1937 Studebaker. It is. And uh, I, c I, can't, I can't imagine what that would have looked like very differently. But um, our uh, our field team, powered by Putnam Leasing, have, uh, we have Alain de Cadenet. I found a 1938, uh, this is a Jaguar, but they were called SS 100s, three and a half liter engine, rather than the SS 90, two and a half liter engine. But so William Lyons who was the person that started the Swallow sidecar company, making sidecars for motorcycles, but eventually calling his car company SS and then Jaguar. But this is a very beautiful little car, in my opinion. Look at all this louvering hair on the, on the bonnet, on the hood. Looks really nice. It's got its British side lights over here on the wings. It's been beautifully restored, too. And I have to tell you a funny story about them. I always fancied having one of these cars. And you could buy them fairly cheaply, sort of back in the late 50s and early 60s. And I remember saying to uh, my Uncle Bertie, Uncle Bertie, I'm going to buy myself an old car. Uh, well, my boy, what are you going to get? I said, well, Uncle Bertie, I've found a thing called an SS100. Oh, he said, surely you don't want one of those. I said, well, I do, Uncle Bertie. It's a really lovely looking car, and I mean, quite cheap. They were 395 pounds new, and you could buy one in 1961 or two for 250 pounds, which is, was then about, what, under, under 500 bucks, I think. Anyway, he was disgusted that I wanted to buy one of these cars. And I said, well, Uncle Bertie, what's the problem with the car? He said, well, they're only ever bought by promenade purses to pick up women. And so therefore, quite unacceptable for a young gentleman to own and drive. Well, that's uh, that's put me in my place because I've a got one of those. Sorry, <laughs> do you? <laughs> <laughs> the it's BMW Classic Trophy is the, um, and that's a Gurney, Gurney Eagle. Eagle. Yeah. Eagle. Look at that! Absolutely great. Again, the evolution of aerodynamics. Look at the uh, the various different two wings on the back of there. That I don't think aerodynamics is ever going to be something that everybody knows everything about. No. It's just one of those things. And they're never going to agree. No, no. <laughs> everybody no. has different ideas. E and even with artificial, artificial intelligence <laughs> and everything else, it's not going to make any difference at all. We have computers even. and they're still changing. Yeah, <laughs> and they're still arguing, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is somewhat uh, satisfying that, uh, that they are still arguing. Um, Mercedes again coming back in front of the judges where uh, we're working through with a tremendous um, display of different cars I, d I don't think that well I was gonna say I don't think you could have done anything better than what we've seen but this is um, 
this is the the whole thing of of different stuff. It's a, the, the one that we have in in stage now is a 1937 car. This is the Chapard Watch Award, the car of timeless elegance. Oh, isn't that, and isn't that look at the it screams timeless elegance, doesn't it? But isn't it interesting? We just heard Alain de Cadenet there talking about the SS100, which is a 1937 car, and then we have this Mercedes here, very different. Yes. Um, that the SS100 is is very low and sports car-y, uh, whereas this is altogether a, a grown-ups car, <laughs> um, that Alain said, that um, <laughs> un Uncle <laughs> Percy said you know, that it's done for a promenade, whatever it was. Um, that one is very much a grown-ups car, and very nice for it too. That one, Alan, was, would maybe have been allowed to purchase. Yes, m <laughs> may maybe <laughs> Uncle would have said, that's okay, you're, uh, you're allowed that one. We have a 1949 Cadillac into into stage now and that that's that's something again that's that's actually got the what we would now talk about as as a fastback on there and this is the winner of the fastback uh, of the most elegant, most elegant Cadillac. Cadillac award and that that's that really has quite a modern look to it it doesn't does it, it does it's uh it just has that um, that window at, at the back with the with the speed back to it. Again, acres of sh bright shiny chrome, uh, but, but only two well. headlights. So only this is the an evolution. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And then, of course, it wouldn't be very long after that. You know, this is 1949. But ten years after that, you'd be moving into the next bit which would be about having the four headlights in the front you know like like Cadillac did but this is uh, this is the award winner and uh, yeah looking absolutely great again this but isn't it different that color on that car yes is of its time it's 1949 yes. uh, and uh, that while we see that car taking his award Joe Bradley is out on the field I've got a 1937 Type 57 Bugatti Monoposto, and Michael Gurton here is the owner of this car. And Michael, even back in the 1930s, it was all about how you put the power down, and this car, quite unique, with the twin wheels at the rear scrambling for that traction and kind of, kind of airing to the wider race tires that we see on contemporary race cars. Exactly so it uh, provides all the scraping that you need to yeah. get up the hills for hill climbs. Um, the car actually is arranged so that you can easily take off the second wheel and you can run it on regular race tracks with single wheels in the back, right. but the double wheels are particularly good for hill climbs. Right, and that's, that's the, getting you out the tight corners. That's for the um, uh, getting the con contact with the road yeah. and being able to push it up the hill. The other distinct thing you pointed out for me, Michael, was this this little bubble on the engine cover here, because this is a unique Bugatti. It's the only Bugatti. Why is that engine bubble there? Uh, it uh, the, is sorry, the, the bonnet bubble. To my knowledge, it's the only Bugatti that carries four carburetors. Right, so you're about to show us, aren't you? That enables the fourth carburetor to fit in there. Right, can we have a look under there? Cool. So we're going to have a look, look under this 19... Looking at this 19... 1937 technology and there's the bubble enabling that fourth carburetor at the front so it's one it's one carburetor per two cylinders pretty much exactly so uh, in most cases you'll see one or two carburetors on a on a Bugatti yeah. this is an eight cylinder Bugatti and then the uh, four carburetors feed the eight cylinders uh, very adequately and it, provides a nice growl when you're driving it. I'm just looking at the way this thing's put together and you consider this is 1930s engineering. That's quite, I mean, nothing's really changed dramatically from that. And we've got a, we've got a picture here of the car in period racing. That is pre-war. You can see the double wheels on the back. Um, the uh, arrangements are the same. It was quite competitive in the pre-war period. And um, so I have a lot of fun racing it now in Monterey and in other places. Yeah. So I, I will be uh, racing it again in August yes. at Monterey in uh, Laguna Seca. So great, great stuff. I'm going to already work on the flight ticket to get out there. Thanks for talking to us, Michael. It's an absolute awesome piece of car. Thank, Thank you. you.
And another one that we have up right now, it's the winner of the, the Buddy Palumbo Award, the car restored by its owner. Isn't you, that wonderful? Yes. And take my, uh, take my hat off to him for that. And he has a very fine hat, but I'll <laughs> take my hat off to him. 1917 locomobile, which uh, it looks great. And it, yeah, there's something rather nice yeah. about an owner restoring something it's himself. It's it becomes personal. It's yeah. It's something that um, that you have your own sweat, your own blood, your own tears yeah. are <laughs> yeah. part of that car. <laughs> I actually raced at Indianapolis. Really? Wow. That's uh, yeah. That makes you think, doesn't it? Um, when we're now back into Ferrari territory. Wow. Th this is uh, this is a car that uh, Alan was. Uh, was getting very excited about yes uh, earlier on today, and it's the now uh, won the Spirit of the One Thousand Megilia Award. The uh, yeah, and of course the the Millimilia was a, a fantastic race that was, as it says in on the title, it was a thousand miles around Italy uh, on public roads, and that whilst the public was uh, discouraged from being on the on the roads at the time it wasn't banned and so people would actually be out there and famously in 1955 Sterling Moss and Dennis Jenkinson won in a, a Mercedes at 99.5 miles an hour average speed for a thousand miles on public roads. It sits uh, rather low for public roads doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you look at it on the grass here. Yeah and, and public roads which were different. Right. Yeah absolutely. Right. Um, that this was actually the uh, one of the one of the type of cars which changed things pretty radically because there was a, a big accident which involved spectators as well as the driver, and that uh, that brought about the end of the Millimilia as we then knew it. It's it still happens. The Millimilia is now a, a retrospective um, and very very popular and is open to. It's only open to, to cars of the type that would have raced oh, it is. there well, at the time, that's um, nice. which is which is really quite something. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, what it means is that you can get out there and have some really good fun. <laughs> and uh, that I've heard stories of uh, of people taking. Have you fifties. ever been? Yes, I have. Yeah, and uh, heard stories of people taking 50 sports cars out to do it, where not only do the the motorcycle police block off all the intersections just so that you can have a go but then another set of, of motorcycle police will get in front and behind you and push you along <laughs> to the point that uh, that you're probably going a little bit faster than you really wanted to, to yes. but uh, but nonetheless it's yeah it's great fun we, uh, we we talked earlier on about some of the cars that have famous history and uh, we're now seeing this one now just is half this close the your eyes. Car? This is the Eisenhower car yep. with the. Oh, and look, we have uh, we have two two dummies in the back, or uh, we have two two heads in the back. Yeah. Um, so we have JFK sitting there, and uh, what what a a treat that is to see that we have this Cadillac, which has got all the trappings of it being a state car. That it's got the obviously the flags on the front. It's got also the siren on the front with the flashing red light to be able to get through there as well. Um, this would have been a state parade car. So that Th this car actually um, has seen a few things. Um, I mentioned earlier that it was built for Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson also used it. This car was behind President Kennedy's Lincoln in Dallas on that fateful day in 1963. Wow, wow. that yep. that really is living history. It is, yes. And that yep. uh, that yep. it was uh, th so that was the that was the car. Don't worry that um, all the Secret Service rode behind him in and. Uh, so that, that car has lived and breathed history. And what a special car that is to see out there today. It was, um, when I saw this car this morning, when we saw it this morning, um, we noticed the kids who were all looking at it. And yeah. It's the Haggerty's uh, youth program, the, a group of, of kids. They look to be um, 
about, I don't know, 8 to maybe a little older than 8, maybe 10 to 14-ish. Yeah, I'd say that. Um, but they were getting a history lesson, too, which was so cool because you, th you think about the next generation learning about cars and the history that they represent and then certainly looking at this car as American youth and seeing something that they will probably never see again. That's right. And, and I think with any education, if you can put it into context, that makes a huge difference. And to be able to do this, then yeah, absolutely right. Well, we talked to Bob Sellers from Reliable Carriers earlier. Let's uh, go back to Joe Bradley, who spoke with a husband and wife duo a little bit earlier. We've been with Bob Sellers most of the morning of, uh, from Reliable Carriers, and we talked about the logistics and the operations of and the job that Reliable Carriers have here at the Amelia Island Concord Elegance. We've caught up with Mike and Cindy White, who are actually a couple of our truck drivers from Reliable Carriers. This is not just your truck, you've been telling me. This is also your home for weeks on end. It, so the, the months on For end. months on months end. On I mean, yeah. end. This that's, is our zip yeah. code. <laughs> that, that's your zip that's code. That's zip code, USA. Because the logistics of the jobs you do mean for you guys to be on the road together. Now, congratulations on this year's anniversary of 50 years oh, married. You. Not only that, but they live in this truck together. I want to tell me, what, what's it like, life on the road? It obviously suits you guys. It's a vacation oh. every day, really. Yeah. I mean, we get to go to all the nice places, you know, Amelia Island, Monterey, everywhere. People retire and talk about taking a motorhome and traveling. You guys do that for a living. We do. <laughs> Aren't we lucky? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of are. Um, I, asked, I asked Bob this question, and I'm going to ask you guys this question. We've seen the parade of cars mm -hmm. uh, that are here at the Concours, and you guys have the job of transporting those cars. So those cars are worth fortunes, you know? Right. When you're hauling this stuff around the country, do you even think about the responsibility that you have? I said to Bob, how do you sleep at night? He says, yeah, it's what we do. It is, it's what we do, and we take every car, no matter what car, and treat it the same. And uh, everything about auto transport is check your cars. Go down the road, check your cars. And when you get the babies to the other end, they're just like you picked them up. And it's a good point, Cindy, that, that Mike makes because I'm, I'm, I'm picking a beautiful Mercedes there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, even if it was like an old Toyota Prius, if you're, if you're transporting it, that, whatever that is is as precious to the owner of that Toyota uh, as it is to a, to a multi-million dollar Jaguar XK120, exactly. isn't it? It's somebody's yeah. baby. I mean, you take care of it like you take care of your own, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, final question, right? right? I know you've been married 50 years, but uh, have a think about it. Who's the best driver? Oh, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> she said that. A woman driver admitting the bloke is the, is the best driver. What good fun. Traveling all over the country with yep. your spouse. Somebody else is paying for it. <laughs> You're yeah, getting no, paid to do it. We, we're now having in stage the, the first Coast News Award um, for the car representing the most advanced styling for its period. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, goes, it almost goes without saying, doesn't it? It's the Mercedes Gullwing, um, surely one of the most beautiful cars ever made. It's, it just has everything with it. And the, the Gullwing wasn't done as a gimmick. It wasn't done to show off. It was just the best way to do it. And that you couldn't really have had door-shaped doors in that. And that, that, was, um, that was just wonderful for the uh, the first coast news award there have been a couple of them um there were two others that have been on display throughout the weekend one of them looked um was restored the other one looked like it wasn't it obviously wasn't restored but it looked more like a mule or a mold or um like a test yeah, a test yeah. model yes yeah but i think that's one of the nice things is that you do get cars which perhaps would have been consigned to the back of the uh the back of the of the garage earlier on, and now they come forward because they are something, something lovely, lovely and special. And that's a Fiat, I think. Yes, this is the FCA trophy for the most elegant FCA car. It's Ralph Jules, the head of design for Fiat Chrysler, um, who's there, heading, uh, giving out the award. 
Oh, he's, he's going to take a selfie. You know, um, I interviewed Ralph um, at a banquet, an ALMS banquet, a few years ago, um, and he took a selfie then as well. So I bet he has this <laughs> wall of, of cool of events that he's been a part of, yes. Yes. Let's go down to, to a field report with Joe Bradley, powered by Putnam Leasing. Uh, we spoke earlier about the this beautiful Jaguar XK120 Roadster that was driven all the way from New York to Sebring, competed in the race and drove back. Well, now I've found the owner, Dr. Richard uh, Santucci. Uh, Richard, this is quite that's quite a story in itself. We've got quite a file of anecdotes there regarding this car's history, and it's quite coloured. Well, I, I originally bought this car from a friend of my dad's, another World War II guy and I've had it for almost 50 years. It was restored 40 years ago. I drove it extensively, and then I hit a deer, and we re-restored it, so. You hit a deer? I hit a deer in Saddle River, yeah. It was right. just another wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out better because the car is looking better than it ever has. So I can show you some of the documentation if you're interested. This is from a reserve box in Sebring. This is the wrong year, but he used to go down on a regular yep. basis and the Jaguar Heritage Certificate, which they tell you that's an original. Yeah. Here's a, a, a Ozzy Lyons picture of it taking a shunt, number 16, yeah. and they're going right off the course into the sandbank. And when we redid the car, we had damage in the fender from the sandbank. This was the starting line of Sebring. I found this at three o'clock in the morning on the internet, and number 16. I said, I think I know that number. Went down and got my paperwork, and sure enough, there it was because there's a copy of the technical inspection record with numbers. That's a scrutineering. Uh, exactly, so that was all, all there. I, I've wow. got the documentation. This was the original purchase order in 1954. How much is that? $3,700. Wow. Because he got the optional C-type head, cost him 150 bucks. The guy drove it every day. He was an Errol Flynn type character. Right. He got married very late in life. My mother said he used to fly around corners and slide in four wheel drifts with this car. He always had another girl. And this was, the he, he raced in Sebring from 53 to 56, I believe. And you could see his, his um, designations where he came in. Interesting was his co-driver, Al Gars, in 54, went out driving his own Jaguar with brake failure. And as a result, he drilled holes in the drums for aeration. Right. For cooling, there's three like that. And I had another gentleman here before who said he has one. And he spoke to Al Gars and told him the same story. Wow. He also told him to drive over to Triborough. Richard, Bridge. we've got to get over okay. to the exhibition. All right, but that that itself is a fantastic deal. I'm glad I've I'm glad I've caught up with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've just have handed out the trophy, the Grand Sport trophy for the most historically significant General Motors competition car. They got it right? Uh, I think they have, <laughs> yeah. I, I also think that perhaps that would have been a contender for the best noise on the yes, field. Because yes. that, uh, that big Chevy with, um, obviously, it's, uh, it's a Roger Penske car, and they always look good, don't they? Mm -hmm. they, uh, they always have that look of love and design. It's well taken care of. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. I, mean, but I, I think probably you know, if, you, if you have that car, it has to look the way that... Uh, that Roger Penske would have had it in period, which would have been perfect. Yes. So it's, uh, yeah, absolutely fine. And absolutely great that uh, that it's there. Um, we uh, we have we have still some uh, some more awards to be given out. Uh, we started a little late with the uh, the awards ceremony today, so. So you're getting extended coverage. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> which is great for me. It's, uh, <laughs> it's certainly working for me, but it's we're seeing lots and lots of different cars. I think that's probably, Jamie, one of the things that I'll take away from particularly this afternoon is the amount of different designs, mm -hmm. styles, backgrounds, cars that we've seen. You, know, you, you can go to car shows and you will get... You know, sort of 40% of them will be of a similar age type. Uh, this because Amelia Island Concorde d'Elegance is the absolutely apogee of the uh, of the races Concorde. But we've seen all sorts of stuff, and that to have seen that that Rothmans Porsche followed by a Stanley Steamer probably says it all for me. Uh, that it's, it's all of that. And we've now got. <laughs> Um, a, an, an award ceremony going on in stage now. And this is for the Ford Motor Company, um, the Bob Gregory Trophy for Enduring Design Excellence. 
That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's excellent, isn't it? You know, going back to what you were saying, that you, c you can go to a car show and, and have winners all from the same mark and um, time period. I think... I, I think that some of the credit of the variety that we've seen it, well, all of the credit really, needs to go to Bill Warner. And not only the collection of cars that he assembled, but the collection of judges. 125 yeah. <laughs> judges we, we went through. Um, we saw a lot of them being presented this morning. But when you have that many, that many people who have a say, and th they're split up. They're not judging all 300 cars individually. But when you have that many people who have a say, um, there are a lot more points that they're judging on. And so you get that variety. You, you, you know, we get to sit here and we watch the winners come through right right next to us, and, and we get to share it um, on here on historicalracingnews.com. But you don't get that because you don't have the variety of judges, and we have that here. Yeah, um, we, we have a huge luxury, actually, Jamie, that, that we can sit here and just, just talk about the things that we like. But <laughs> in, in all truth, it's a lot more than that because clearly the judges... But yeah, they need to be um, sort of subjective and sort of otherwise. They you know, that they need to be objective as well. Um, these cars have significant history, every single one of them. But you know, how they've been restored and those sorts of thing, and that now we have a, another Ferrari into uh, into stage. It's a we 58. This is the, the Gil Nickel Farniette Award for the entrant best emulating the spirit of Gil Nickel. Okay, and, and, and <laughs> we talked about the whole thing of you know, Ferraris that have got 250. Yeah. In, uh, in, you know, anything with a 250 in a Ferrari is, is cool and good and lovely, and this doesn't actually change anything. However, we talked about the various different shades of red yes. that you see on a Ferrari, and here's a white one. It's a white one. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't see many white Ferraris, but as I sit here, I'm reminded from a, mo a modern-day white Ferrari, if you see the WeatherTech banners back behind, uh, there is a white Ferrari. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> I think certainly, certainly on track. Yes, we, we, on the racetrack. We do see rather more white Ferraris, and of course, it shows up be better on TV, and that it's good for sponsors mm -hmm. and, and all those things. This but is a beautiful car, though. I, you don't see many white ones. No, that's lovely. That is absolutely lovely and sculpted. I mean, that that looks as if it's been made out of a single piece of, does. of wood, doesn't it? It does, yeah, yes. That somebody's rubbed it down. And that now, what is this? That, uh, again, you know, the, the variation is just yes. incredible. That the swoopy lines that we see there with that, um, that, that whole thing. It, it's a, a long, it's a very long car just with two seats. So it's, uh, that's an Isotto Fran Francini. Um, and this is for the John, Judge John North trophy. Um, for the best new coach work or recreation, so. Yeah, well, I can I can forgive them for all of that. Yeah, because <laughs> it just looks. But that's why it pulls in, and you say, "Hmm." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's uh, as as the saying goes, it's drop dead gorgeous. It is. It's uh, it's just got everything. I, I love that that swoopiness of it, where it, it sort of ducks down ahead of the rear wheels, and then it's all it's all power and go and. But it has the harshness of the straight line of the bumper, um, which which you don't see. It doesn't stand out on many of them, but I think it does make the, the swoopiness stand out a little bit more because yeah. it has some contrast to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of unusual bumper at the front there because it's a bit utilitarian, but it's, uh, it's nonetheless a, a lovely, lovely mm -hmm. car. And uh, yes, for, its, for either a, a rebody or a recreation, and that that's exactly what it should be and, and looking great. And again, we've talked about this a lot over the course of the last few hours, that you would feel a million a million dollars just doing that. Let's, let's hear this conversation. Once again. Thank you, Pat. Pat Ryan from Asheville, North Carolina. <laughs> well, we missed that one. Oh, well, we, <laughs> you okay. win some and lose some. Yeah. But we do know that Pat Ryan is driving that car. <laughs> he is from North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. And it's that's, beautiful. Uh, that's yeah. good. And uh, still they come. Still, they come. And, uh, but this is this is another variation. So we see the the rear wheel spats, which were very much a feature, kind of when cars were works of art, and that 
there's almost a piece where, which says, right, okay, so yeah, we know it's got to have wheels, we know that it's got to be a car, but let's actually make it as artistic as we can. And if, if, if that means that we've got to cover up the, the rear wheels, then so be it. That, that's, that Delahaye is absolutely lovely, and that's, um, that's obviously a, uh, a, a proper a proper body work on that and uh, that's getting the award for the there. most elegant open car it's the the Kemp Stickney award yeah that's uh, that says it all doesn't it that's uh, that has everything that that is elegant it is that's elegant exactly what it is it's it's got everything going for it you said something interesting about um, when cars were were a piece of art I know you're obviously a founded historicracingnews.com, so hi the, his the history of the automobile is, is where your passion lies, but do you think modern day cars are still works of art? <laughs> yes and no, uh, but, but I think you know, the old saying that nostalgia isn't what it used to be, uh, that I think you can, you can get to that point where not all cars in the 30s were beautiful. Not all cars in the 40s or 50s. Fair enough. Um, and that, yeah, we have some beautiful cars out there. Mm -hmm. And that there are some some lovely cars that, in the same way, way as there were lovely cars in the 30s. Whether whether they will last as well, who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're in a situation now where the world is changing so incredibly quickly because... We are going to see the end of the the whole internal combustion engine thing, well, whether it's ten years or twenty years or we don't know, years. right? But we are going to see the end of it sooner or later, and I think that's going to change things because you know we hear an awful lot about younger people have no desire to drive anymore, um, and that. Whereas it was the only thing in, in my life, I didn't want to go to history lessons or chemistry lessons, but I wanted to be able to drive. And that younger people don't want to do that. Anymore. No, I was talking to um, Doug Feehan, who's the program director for Corvette Racing, and he told me, this was just a couple months ago, that General Motors, as a corporation, obviously, they have to do studies of who, who are their demographic, who are their customers, who are they reaching out to, and what they have found is that in the United States, 16 is the age of what you're, you're allowed to get your driver's license, but in the United States, 50% of 19-year-olds do not have their driver's license. Wow. 50%. Now, you see, if, if I was a motor manufacturer, that would really worry me. Yes, and you, you look at... Who, who buys cars from, from 16 to 19? I mean, obviously their parents, but, but what cars are they buying? It's, it's the, the bottom line. Um, and if those cars aren't being purchased, then what is it that you're manufacturing? At, the, at what price point do you start your, your lineup at? Um, and, and what are the triggers? It, right, yeah. right, yep. So the Meguiar's People's Choice Award. The best car is chosen by the vote of the people. They had a big setup. Um, they were handing out free espresso the last couple of days. I may have stopped by the Maguire's tent a couple of times. Um, Just right. been a part of the concourse. <laughs> and Maguire's, of course, have yes. been involved with, with this concourse pretty much since it started yes. and, uh, and, and very much a part of the scene here at Amelia Island, Concours d'Elegance. Let's listen in and see, uh, see, see what's going on there. No microphone on that exchange, um, but you saw the smile. The smile. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you could bottle smiles, then yes. uh, we, we could open a shop. Could we sell them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a good one. We could open a shop. Look at, the, uh, look at the shape of that car with, uh, with that very enclosed cockpit. That these cars are big cars. It's a big car, but it's a tiny. Yeah. <laughs> little section, almost dead center. Yeah, and, and not really much else. Um, mm -hmm. Now, whether that car would have the uh, the fold-out dicky seat in the back, I'm not sure. But uh, but nonetheless, as a day-to-day -day car, there is not a lot of did space in it. Did they have the dicky seat with the the wheel on the back? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. you could do. Um, um, the the thing is, I think that in those in those heady thirties days, you did it for style. Mm. It's what it was going to look like. Um, it's it's how you impressed everybody when you arrived. I'd be impressed. <laughs> if I was standing in a valet line and that car drove up today, I would be impressed. Yeah, I'd be very <laughs> impressed today. But, um, but I think would have been then. And oh, absolutely. Talk about coach work. Just look at this. Mm -hmm. Just look at this. That, that has been made out of melted butter, hasn't it? That's, <laughs> that's just so beautiful. This is the, uh, the uh, Amelia Island Award. And this is for the, the, the best car and it's a Duesenberg mm -hmm. so we've we haven't seen too many Duesenbergs today but, uh, but 1935 that's absolutely great um, known as a town car of course yes. those cars were and uh, that there you have the driver who sat out in the cold outside mm -hmm. yeah and that the owner sat in the back in the wall and that's probably how in, in those days that's how you knew you made it yeah. <laughs> when, when you were sitting in closed and your driver was sitting outside yes yes <laughs> and, and also of course there is there is in there the the speaking to you mm. so that you could give instructions to your driver saying slow down speed up so the Amelia Island award there for the most elegant formal sedan or town car and so that's the uh, the Duesenberg the winner of that award um, I like that the phrasing of that the formal sedan yes <laughs> yes well, we don't have formal sedans no we now. don't we have uh, we have cars full of McDonald's wrappers and, <laughs> 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 and we certainly don't have anything formal yep. um, but, and, and you've, you've talked a lot about the colors of cars mm -hmm. that 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 is so good because you don't kind of notice the color if that makes right. sense um, it just looks right. It does. And it's that greeny silver, um, and yeah, that's that would be there. Those those um, little bits of chrome behind the rear doors, which are are there to give it the look of it being what a is convertible. This the the hump. The hump is the spare wheel. Um, oh, so it's in case there. Yes, that was. You know, so they've they have just thrown a very big bit of silk cloth. It is over, elegant. Over the car and said, yeah, this is what That's a great way to, it, it does look like a piece of silk was thrown over it. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's You're right. That's, that's all it is. And, and some yet, yet more beautiful cars coming uh, coming into shot. I think that's, that looks a bit Cadillac-y to me, but I'm, mm -hmm. not a, I'm not a Cadillac expert. It does look like Cadillac. Yep. This is the, the Craftsman Phil Hill Award um, for the restore of the best new production car restoration, and it is a 1936 Cadillac. And wow, so we got that one right then. Yes. Um, <laughs> Phil Hill, of course, um, one of the greatest race drivers ever to come out of North America. And uh, but, uh, nice to see his name on on this mm -hmm. and that uh, that Cadillac looking great. The uh, the other thing that you don't see much these days, Jamie, is white wall tires. No. Um, and for me, I think they're, they're great. I think yep. they, they add something to the car. It's also kind of interesting that if you go back even further than this, mm -hmm. what you actually end up with is that in the early days of motoring, the, the, the tires themselves were colored. Let's, let's, let's see if we can listen in on this. This is Wayne Carini. Oh, handing off the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> We're really not doing very well on listening in, are we? Um, but, uh, yeah, a, a very big card there to go into. Yeah. Not a huge... Not a huge area. You know, Lightning McQueen um, from the Cars movies, he had white walls. Did he? He did. Right. Yes, my my four-year-old knows what white walls are because of oh Lightning really? McQueen. Yes. Oh, right. Oh, well, the legend lives <laughs> on yes. there. Yeah, yeah, that's... 
That's all right. What, yep. what another thing, we're just while we're on the subject of, of lightning, um, that stuck out to me at the, the Porsche seminar um, yesterday when they were introducing the, the panelists, David Hobbs was one of the panelists, which was quite funny if, if um, you heard any of the stories that were told. They weren't quite sure why David Hobbs <laughs> was there. Um, but he was he had the distinction of being the only member on the, the Porsche 962 Dynasty panel who has his own action figure because he was David... Um, um, hubcaps, I believe it was, yep. in, in the Cars movies. <laughs> that's, that's so good. I mean, that yep. is just, just brilliant that, uh, that you can have your own action figure. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think in my case it would be an inaction figure. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't, We've talked a lot about Mercedes and we have another one in front of the judges right now receiving his award. Um, and that's, again, a 1930s I think that's 500k, but I wouldn't want to uh, wouldn't want to put serious money on that. But nonetheless, looking brilliant in that very very gloss black. Um, but you just know that that is polished to within yes. an inch of its life, and, uh, and looking tremendous for it. Imagine being the person who has to polish it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and and all the chrome. Yeah, uh, you you just would hate it to be out here on show field mm -hmm. you know that uh, you spend a week getting it ready and then it's out on the show field with people touching it and get off right stop it it's it's not just any piece of grass though right this is the yeah. this this is the golf course at the ritz carlton so yes. it's not oh oh and and you you may have heard the um the crowd. the crowd in the background there because the that beautiful Mercedes very nearly <laughs> hit our camera gantry so uh, thankfully he didn't but um, but makes his his way off the field to it was lucky I'm not going to blame the driver because I, no. I really think there really wasn't much turning circling available to him but uh, a quick heart stopping moment there mm -hmm. which, uh, which we don't need this late in the day you think about our poor camera operator who's sitting behind that jib camera and he's looking through a viewfinder, not looking at the legs yeah. <laughs> of, the, of the tripod the camera's sitting on. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's one of those ones where you think, am I really saying this? Right. Am I really, really taking part in this? So and why is everybody gasping? <laughs> as, as the gantry falls mm -hmm. in a heap. Um, but we've, uh, we ha really have seen some superb cars here and... Uh, and still they come. The uh, the grass has held up here in the uh, awards circle. There's a little, there's a, a depth. You can tell where the cars have come through. Um, but considering this morning, it, it's it's March in, yeah. in Florida, and there was a, a substantial amount of dew on the grass. It was pretty wet this morning. And when you think about that, it is it has held up fairly well. Yeah, I think had it been... Had it been wetter, mm -hmm. it would have been much more of a problem. And thank goodness that we've actually been able to run this on the Sunday because yes. this is the first Sunday that the Amelia Island Concorde d'Elegance has been able to run on the Sunday. Last year, it was a very, very unfavorable weather report for uh. the Sunday. And Bill Warner and his crew made the decision that they said, we're not going to risk it. So yep. that the cars and coffee that we saw yesterday was moved to an adjacent field on the Saturday and that we ran the Concorde d'Elegance on the Saturday as well. The, the year before that, in, um, in 2017, it was dreadful. Here and is a best in show. Here we go for the best in show. the music. <laughs> Nineteen thirty eight Mercedes Benz five forty K Autobahn Tour from the Keller Collection at the Pyramids in Petaluma, California. Nineteen fifty seven Ferrari three thirty five S from Cavallino Investments in Cortland, Ohio. 
the Mercedes, Concorde d'Elegance, and the Ferrari Concorde de Sport. Trophies to be presented by the general manager of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, Mr. Jim McMenamon. And Jackie Eakes, world famous race car driver, Jackie Eakes. as the, uh, the live fanfare moves away um, and that we see some very, very happy people are receiving these awards. The Autobahn Tourer from the 500K Mercedes and for the Ferrari as well, which uh, is kind of dwarfed by that big it black car. <laughs> it is, it looks so tiny. Um, parked right in front of it. When they were pulling nose to nose, I got a little bit worried about that. <laughs> can, can it see the Ferrari? <laughs> yeah, I know it's there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the Concorde d'Elegance and the Concorde Sport, and uh, those, those, both of those two are out there. Bill Warner giving a huge round of applause. Deservedly, yes. The 2019 Ritz. Carlton Best in Show for the Amelia Island Concorde de Elegance. What a fantastic weekend. Oh, it's been, been absolutely brilliant. The, all the way through from start to finish. From the, the, the various different activities. We have the, the Eight Flags Tour, which happened um, the heat earlier in the week. Cars yeah. and coffee. Absolutely, we had we had all of that. We saw the reliable carriers, eight flags tour, the Peacock cars and coffee, and then everything that's happened today, Jane. Yes. And uh, that it, it couldn't have gone better. And the weather's been great. It's a bit sticky. Yes. It's been, it's, uh, uh, I'm not going to complain about the sunshine being no, out there. No, and of course, our, our field team, powered by Putnam Leasing, we had Joe Bradley and Alan DeCatene. Fantastic work, oh, really giving us a behind the scenes. Uh, not only look at the cars, but the stories behind the cars and the, the people who brought them to us. Just fa fascinating. I've it, learned so much today being a part of this. It's been it's been an absolute ball, and, and to have uh, both Alan Tukadne and Joe Bradley out there, yeah, they've they've done a tremendous job as as part of our field team powered by Putnam Leasing, and uh, and, and thank you to all of our sponsors for allowing us to get to the point where we could bring this to you. But, uh, uh, we have we have some some very, very happy people. The champagne is now flowing and uh, that there's going to be lots of happy people tonight. Yes. But two very, very happy teams. And they've allowed uh, done that. photographers to come out and, and take the photographs. And it's just a very, it's a very neat atmosphere right now. You know, we've sat here in the, in the sun, um, we, but we had our umbrellas. We did. <laughs> so we, uh, you may uh, not have seen them on camera, but they were brightly colored rainbow <laughs> variety. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, we did have some shade protection, but our field team, um, powered by Putnam Leasing, did not. So they were out there battling the sunshine um, all day long, doing fantastic coverage for us. Um, let's get a final thought from Joe Bradley. All I can say is, if you are a kindred spirit like we are to the automobile and you're a car buff, a car geek, a petrol head, this event has got to be on your calendar of events to visit sometime. It's a bucket list event. I've been overwhelmed. I've lost count of the amount of times I've been stopped by tracks by the kind of cars we see here. The history, Jackie Hicks coined it though. This place has soul. This is truly the racer's concourse. Everybody said it for the last couple of days, and until I sat here with you, Paul, and, and saw the cars coming through, I couldn't actually appreciate that. I did not know what I was getting into um, before noon today. <laughs> this, this was fantastic, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I can only echo everybody's sentiments that this is something which is very, very special. But you can, there, there are car shows all over the world, but they don't have the soul that this place has. They don't have the feel. 
that we have to congratulate every single one of the winners that we've seen because there's so much effort going into that. I would also like to, before we end our show and we roll out here, I want to say congratulations to you as well because without historicracingnews.com, we would not have a place for this to air currently. So thank you for all of the effort that you put in to bringing this to the live stream and certainly reliable carriers for presenting this for us. Um, fantastic event. I think it is. And uh, yeah, we, we can't go without saying thank you to Jim Roller and, and all the crew behind yes, the scenes. everybody. Because uh, that has been a tremendous job. It's been, been five hours, but yep. uh, it's been something really special. And thank you, Jamie, for, uh, for you. everything that you've done. No, thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I will certainly be back, whether I am working this live stream <laughs> or this show. Um, again, I, I will be back. I want to bring my kids. I want everybody to get to walk around and experience this. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.